Sadhu, 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 Namo Tase Bhagavato Arahato, Sama Sambuddhase, Namo Tase Bhagavato Arahato, Sama Sambuddhase, Namo Tase Bhagavato Arahato, Sama Sambuddhase, Homage to the Blessed One, the Worthy One, the Supremely Enlightened One, Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Namo Buddhaya. Fellow monks, Meritorious lay disciples. Our great teacher, the Supreme Buddha, said this to his disciples. He said, Bhikkhus, give up, unwholes give up unwholesomeness. It is possible to give up unwholesomeness. If it were not possible to give up unwholesomeness, I would not say, bhikkhus, give up unwholesomeness. Since it is possible to give up unwholesomeness, I say, bhikkhus, give up unwholesomeness. If giving up unwholesomeness caused detriment and suffering, I would not say, give up unwholesomeness. Since abandoning unwholesomeness brings benefit and happiness, I say thus, give up unwholesomeness. So the Blessed One very clearly tells us, those things that are unwholesome, we should give those up. That it's possible to give them up. That, that this life, it's, we're not stuck with the unwholesome qualities in our mind. We're not stuck with the unwholesome behaviors that we do. It's possible to abandon those to give them up through training. He says, if, if giving up these unwholesome qualities caused us harm, if it was bad for us in this life and in future lives, he says, I wouldn't tell you to give them up. But because giving up unwholesome qualities is good for you in this life and future lives as well, he says, give up these unwholesome qualities. So what are the things that the Supreme Buddha tells us are unwholesome. What is it that's unwholesome that we should give up? The Supreme Buddha says greed is unwholesome. Hatred is unwholesome. Delusion is unwholesome. So the greedy thoughts that we have, thoughts of, of wanting more things, more possessions, right? More cars, more houses, right? These are unwholesome thoughts. These lead to our, our harm, not to our benefit. Thoughts of hatred, when we, when we have hatred towards other people, it, it hurts ourselves and it hurts the other people as well. When we have thoughts of delusion, we don't act properly, right? When we think that there's no purpose in giving, we don't, we don't practice dhana. When we think that there's no results of, of good and bad actions, we don't, we don't abandon those, those bad actions. The Blessed One also teaches us, he says, bhikkhus, cultivate wholesomeness. It's possible to cultivate wholesomeness. If it were not possible to cultivate wholesomeness, I would not say, bhikkhus, cultivate wholesomeness. Since it is possible to cultivate wholesomeness, I say, bhikkhus, cultivate wholesomeness. So when we, when we listen to the Dhamma and we learn about these, these wholesome qualities, we know it's actually possible to develop these in our mind. That they're not things that you're either born with or you're not born with. Right? 
that some families have wholesomeness, some families don't have wholesomeness, that it's not something that, that we're, we're stuck without, that it's actually something we can develop, we can learn about, and we can try very hard to cultivate these wholesome things. The Supreme Buddha says, if cultivating wholesomeness caused detriment and suffering, I would not say cultivate wholesomeness. Since the cultivation of wholesomeness brings benefit and happiness, I say cultivate wholesomeness. So he's not asking us to do something that's going to hurt us. Right? This, this cultivating wholesome qualities, it's a lot of work. But as we, as we struggle, as we work hard at it, we know that it's good for us, that it's going to lead to our benefit, both in this life and future lives as well. So what, what are the things the Supreme Buddha said are wholesome? Non-greed is, is wholesome. Non-hatred is wholesome. Non-delusion is wholesome. So practicing generosity, thoughts of non-greed, wanting to, to give things away, not wanting to collect things. Thoughts of loving kindness, thoughts about the welfare of other people, not thoughts of anger, not, not thoughts of hatred. Thoughts of wisdom, right? Trying to understand the Four Noble Truths. These, these are wholesome actions. They bring our benefit. They're, they're for our own welfare. So in many ways, the Supreme Buddha taught us about these wholesome qualities. He made, he made a very definite statement that there are wholesome qualities. He wasn't, he wasn't wishy-washy. He said, there are things that are wholesome, right? Non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion. These are definitely wholesome. Not killing, not stealing, not lying. These are all wholesome things that he said absolutely are wholesome. But not everyone who hears the Dhamma can understand it. Some people uh, hear it incorrectly and they misunderstand the Dhamma because they don't, they don't have this wisdom. So today we, we're going to listen to a sutta about some people who, who didn't understand the Dhamma. So this is the Vajya Mahita Sutta from the Anguttara Nikaya. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Champa on a bank of the Gagara Lotus Pond. Then the householder, Vajya Mahita, left Champa in the middle of the day to see the Blessed One. Then it occurred to him, it is not the proper time to see the Blessed One who is in seclusion nor to see the esteemed bhikkhus, who are also in seclusion. Let me go to the park of the wanderers of other sects. So this householder, Vajya Mahita, he was a noble disciple. He was a, he was a true uh, disciple of the Supreme Buddha. And he knew the Supreme Buddha's habits. He knew that, that early in the day, the Supreme Buddha liked to dwell in seclusion. Right. The same with, uh, with the monks and the nuns, that, that early in the day they were practicing meditation. They were, they were cultivating wholesome qualities. So he thought, it's too early to see them. They're not going to be out. They're, they're going to be alone uh, in their kutis. So why don't I go to the park where the wanderers from other sects hang out? Now, do you think that he, he wanted to go there so he, could learn, so he could learn their Dhamma? No, no. When a noble disciple goes uh, to see other recluses and Brahmins, they go with the intention of helping them, right? Or, or simply to be polite, right? In the time of the Supreme Buddha, people respected uh, all sorts of, of practices, uh, the religious practices that people had. They were very polite. Uh, and they like to, to engage in these, these conversations. But this, uh, this householder, Vajya Mahita, 
he didn't need to go to them to learn Dhamma, right? He, he knows that he can go to the Supreme Buddha to learn the Dhamma. Then the householder, Vajyamahita, went to the park of the wanderers of other sects. Now on that occasion, the wanderers of other sects had assembled and were making an uproar as they loudly and boisterously sat discussing various pointless topics. So were these, were these wanderers alone in their kutis, meditating? No. It was very early in the day, and already they had gotten together. To talk about Dhamma? No. To talk about useless things, right? What could they have been talking about? Maybe politics? Talking about kings or robbers? Talking about fashion? You know, who knows? Gossip? All sorts of bad things. You know, when they come from different areas, maybe they get together and, and talk about the news in, in different places. You know, what's going on in my hometown? You know, who's gotten married? Right? Who's died? Right? So, when, when wanderers from other sects get together, these may be the kind of things that, that they talk about. So then the wanderers saw the householder Vajyamahita coming in the distance and silenced one another. So they saw him and, and they decided to get quiet. They said, sirs, be quiet. Sirs, do not make any noise. Here comes the householder Vajyamahita, a disciple of the ascetic Gotama. One among the ascetic Gotama's white-robed lay disciples who resides in Champa. So this venerable, uh, this uh, householder, Vajyamahita, he wore white clothes, right? He was very dedicated uh, to the Supreme Buddha's practice. And, and he even had a reputation, right? These wanderers knew, knew who he was, even seeing him coming in the distance. They said, now these venerable ones are fond of quiet, disciplined in quiet, and speak in praise of quiet. Perhaps if he finds that our assembly is quiet, he will think to approach us. Then the wanderers of other sects became silent. Okay, so they've, they've heard that, that the Supreme Buddha and his disciples, they appreciate silence. What did the Supreme Buddha tell us when we come together? We should either do one of two things. We should talk about the Dhamma. Yeah, observe noble silence, right? So these are the two, uh, the two things that we can do when we come together. So these wanderers had heard at least, uh, at least that much and understood, uh, they understood that much, that, that the disciples of the Supreme Buddha liked silence. Then the householder, Vajyamahita, approached those wanderers and engaged greetings with them. When they had concluded their greetings and cordial talk, he sat down to one side. The wanderers then said to him, Is it true, householder, as it is said, that the ascetic Gotama criticizes all austerities and that he unreservedly condemns and reproves all who live a harsh and austere life? So what's the rumor that they've heard? that the Supreme Buddha criticizes all austerities, that without reservation, he says, any austere practice is bad, and those people who do any sort of austere practice, they should be condemned. This is, this is the rumor that they've heard. So they're asking the householder, Vajyamahita, is this true, as we've heard, that the, that the Buddha, the recluse Gotama, Right? They don't call him the Supreme Buddha. They call him the Reckless Gotama. That, that he condemns any sort of austere practice, any sort of uh, harsh life. And the householder, Vajyamahita, says, No, Bhante. The Blessed One does not criticize all austerities, and he does not unreservedly condemn and reprove all who live a harsh and austere life. So he says, no, that's, that's not correct. 
the Blessed One criticizes what deserves criticism and praises what is praiseworthy. By criticizing what deserves criticism and praising what is praiseworthy, the Blessed One speaks on the basis of distinctions. He does not speak about such matters one-sidedly. So what does the, the Supreme Buddha criticize? Those things that should be criticized. And what does he praise? The things that should be praised, right? It's a, it's a subtle thing. By criticizing what deserves criticism and praising what is praiseworthy, the Blessed One speaks on the basis of distinctions. He does not speak about such matters one-sidedly. Right? So the Supreme Buddha, he understands the subtleties of things. He doesn't, he doesn't make broad generalities right, when it's not appropriate. When this was said, a wanderer said to the householder, Vajya Mahita, Wait a moment, householder. The ascetic Gautama, who you are praising, is an abolitionist who refrains from making definite declarations. So uh, it was very common that, that people like to debate right, about religious things. They would argue and they would try and win, win debates so they could become popular, maybe receive more, more alms, more requisites. So these, uh, these recluses, they're very accustomed to debating. And so when they, when they think they can, they can catch someone uh, saying something incorrect, they, they jump on it right away. Right? So he says, wait, uh, that ascetic Gotama, he's an abolitionist who refrains from making definite declarations. So there are some, uh, some people who held views that, that they, wouldn't, they wouldn't agree to anything, right? Someone went to the Supreme Buddha and said, I don't praise anything at all, right? I don't, I don't agree with anything at all. And some people, when, when you would try and press them on what their views were, they would just kind of wriggle around, right? They were called eel wrigglers. You know, like a snake will will wriggle back and forth to try and get away. They would say, you know, I don't say this, I don't say that, I don't say it is, I don't say it isn't. If I thought it wasn't, then I would say it wasn't, but I don't say it wasn't because I don't think it isn't, right? They would go back and forth like that. So they're accusing the Supreme Buddha of, of being one of these people who doesn't really know the answer, and so they just sort of, they try and wriggle out of it. Right? Try and make excuses. Try and uh, try and lead it aside. So, is the Supreme Buddha someone who doesn't know the answers? No, he knows the answers very well. The householder Vajjamahita says, "I will deal with that point too, Bhante." The Blessed One has validly declared, this is wholesome, and this is unwholesome. Thus, when he declares what is wholesome and what is unwholesome, the Blessed One makes definite declarations. Remember what the Blessed One said was, was unwholesome? Greed, hatred, delusion. Right? The, the Supreme Buddha is, is very clear on that, that greed is unwholesome and that non-greed is wholesome, that, that hatred is wholesome, and being free from hatred, uh, that hatred is unwholesome, and being free from hatred is wholesome. Thus, when he declares what is wholesome and what is unwholesome, the Blessed One makes definite declarations. He is not an abolitionist who refrains from making definite declarations. When this was said, those wanderers sat silenced, disconcerted, hunched over, downcast, glum, and speechless. So this is what happens when, when we're really interested in debating, right? We're not interested in finding the truth. So when someone else wins the debate, we're sad, right? They didn't know what to say. They just know how to debate. They know how to criticize. Right? They know how to look for things and, and try and criticize. But did they, did they ask questions? Did they say, well, tell us what's wholesome? 
right? It's pretty clear you need to know what's wholesome. You need to know what's unwholesome. Were they interested in that? No. They were just bummed that they didn't that they didn't win the debate, right? They thought they they thought they had him, but they didn't. Then the householder, Vajyamahita, having understood that those wanderers sat silenced, disconcerted, hunched over, downcast, glum, and speechless, rose from his seat and went to the Blessed One. He paid homage to the Blessed One, sat to one side, and reported to the Blessed One his entire conversation with those wanderers of other sects. The Blessed One said, Good householder, good, good. It is in such a way that those hollow men should from time to time be thoroughly refuted with reasoned argument. So he approved of what the householder did. He said, yes, it's good. From time to time, people should explain to them the Dhamma. They should, uh, they should refute their arguments with reasons. Right. The Supreme Buddha said, I do not say, householder, of every kind of austerity that it should be practiced, nor do I say of every kind of austerity that it should not be practiced. So he doesn't say any, any sort of harsh practice should be done, but he also doesn't say that, that there's no austere practices, right? There's no uh, very harsh uh, practices that, that should be done. I do not say of every observance that it should be undertaken, nor do I say of every observance that it should not be undertaken. So he doesn't say that, that you shouldn't do anything, right? And he also doesn't say you should, you know, anything that there is to do, you should do that. I do not say that one should strive in every way, nor do I say that one should not strive in any way. So he says, you shouldn't, you shouldn't strive for everything. You shouldn't work hard at, at any old thing. And at the same time, he says, I don't say you shouldn't strive either, right? that, that you're going to get anywhere from doing nothing at all. He says, I don't say that either. I do not say that one should make every kind of relinquishment. So he doesn't say that we should give everything away, we should give everything up. Nor do I say that one should not make any kind of relinquishment. So he says, I don't say that, that there aren't some things that you should give up, right? I do not say that one should attain every kind of liberation, nor do I say that one should not attain any kind of liberation. If, householder, when one practices a particular austerity, unwholesome qualities increase and wholesome qualities decline, then I say one should not practice such an austerity. But if, when one practices a particular austerity, unwholesome qualities decline and wholesome qualities increase, then I say one should practice such an austerity. So let's think about the, the austere practices that we know about that were done in the time of the Supreme Buddha. So there were some, uh, some religious wanderers who ate extremely small amounts of food, right? just one, one small handful of food each day, one small handful of food every two days, every three days, even just once a week. Right? Only eating once a week. Or just eating a single grain of rice. Right? Just a single grain of rice and subsisting on that. So some of these practices, even the Supreme Buddha uh, tried when he was, uh, when he was uh, practicing, trying to attain enlightenment. But did he find that, that this practice of, of only eating tiny amounts of food was beneficial? 
did he he think oh this is this is the way that we get free from this round of samsara no what can happen to some uh, some recluses that try and do that they try and only eat you know just one grain of rice a day eventually what do they do they give it up completely right and then they go home and they eat lots and lots of food right because the body just can't function on that small amount of food. So for those recluses, did wholesome qualities increase or did wholesome qualities decrease? Yeah, they didn't increase. There were some, uh, some people who, who thought that it was beneficial to go naked, to walk around without any clothes on, right? The Supreme Buddha said, no, that's not beneficial. In fact, the, the monks and the nuns are forbidden from undertaking this, this practice of, of nakedness, right? If, if going naked cultivated wholesome qualities, wouldn't all the animals in the world, right? They would all go right to heaven, right? Because they don't wear any clothes at all, right? So the Supreme Buddha said, yeah, this is not beneficial. Don't do this practice. There are some, some people who thought that, that uh, bathing in, the, in a river three times a day, you know, very hard on the skin to, to be in the water that, that often. They thought that this would, would, uh, would wash away all their unwholesome qualities. We remember uh, there was a, an arahant nun, Punnika, who had a conversation with, with one of these people who was down at the river doing this. He was so happy, he said, oh good, you've come to join me. You know, we're gonna do something wholesome, washing away uh, our, bad, our bad actions. And she says, really? You think that that's gonna do anything? How could that possibly work? You know, if, if this river could wash away unwholesome qualities, then, then, then all the fishes and the turtles, right? they would be perfectly wholesome, right? They would go right to heaven, right? She said, if this river washes away all your unwholesome qualities, won't it wash away your wholesome qualities too? Won't it wash away the good things that you've done? Right? She says, if you're doing bad things, stop doing those bad things, right? Why, whatever the reason is that you're coming down here to wash, whatever bad things you're trying to wash away, don't do those bad things. That's how, you, that's how you become pure, right? The Supreme Buddha said this, this bathing in the river, it doesn't do anything to cultivate wholesome qualities. And if you think that, that all you have to do is, is go take a bath and that washes away all the bad things that you do, it would be very easy to do bad things, right? You know, we can work outside very hard in the yard, get very dirty because we know we just come in and, and take a bath and we're fine. Right? If we thought that, that we could do all sorts of bad things, killing, stealing, lying, and then just take a bath, right? It would be very simple. We could do lots and lots of unwholesome things. So what are the, what are the austere practices that the Supreme Buddha did praise? He praised this eating, eating a meal once a day. He encouraged his monks and nuns. He said, you know, I, I eat one meal a day, and because of that, I enjoy health. Right? I'm happy, I'm contented. Do this, try this practice of eating one meal a day. Right? He didn't say only eat one grain of rice a day. He said eat one meal a day. Eat enough, eat enough just to fill your stomach. Right? Don't eat too much, don't eat too little. But even still, this only eating once a day, it's definitely an austere practice. Not very many people in the world do this, do this practice. It's much easier to just eat all day long. You know, whenever you feel hungry, you eat. But instead, he encouraged his monks and nuns, be content just with this, with this one meal. When you do this, wholesome qualities will increase. You'll, you'll develop contentment. You'll be happy with just, just what you have. You won't be thinking all day long about how you can, how you can go around and get food. You can, you can practice cultivating wholesome qualities. He encouraged uh, the practice of, of eating alms food, right? That 
just wandering from house to house, accepting whatever it is that people give. It's a very excellent way to practice contentment. Walking around without any expectations. If they give food, good. If they don't give food, that's okay. I'll have more time to, to practice meditation. Not, not going just to the houses that have delicious food, but just going house to house, accepting whatever's often offered. He also encouraged the practice of, of just living in the forest, outside of the rainy season, just living under the foot of a tree. Right? Not, not living out in the sun. You know, some, some recluses thought that by living in the sun all day long they could purify their unwholesome qualities. But the Supreme Buddha said, no, live, live under the protection of a tree. It'll help you cultivate contentment. You won't be greedy for fancy lodgings. You'll see that you can make do with just very simple things. Think about the Venerable Maha Kasapa, who practiced these, these austere practices. He wore rough robes. He wore robes from a cemetery. The Supreme Buddha praised Maha Kasapa for these for these austere practices that he did. Because they're practices that cultivate wholesome qualities, that cultivate contentment, cultivate happiness with just what we have. Then the Supreme Buddha said, if householder, when one undertakes a particular observance, unwholesome qualities increase, and wholesome qualities decline, then I say one should not undertake such an observance. But if when one undertakes a particular observance, unwholesome qualities decline and wholesome qualities increase, then I say one should undertake such an observance. So do you remember uh, Sania, the dog duty ascetic? Right? We learned about him in the, the Kukuravataka Sutta. Kukuravataka Sutta. And Punna, the ox duty ascetic, what was their observance? They lived like animals, right? Sanya lived like a dog. He ate his food off the ground, right? He didn't wear clothes. He just would, would curl up and lay down on the ground. Right? He wouldn't talk to people. He would run away from people. Punna, he lived like an ox. Right, standing on all fours, eating grass, right? And one day they had the, the great opportunity to come and talk to the Supreme Buddha. And they said, you know, we've we've perfected these practices. You know, isn't this excellent? Right? We act exactly like animals. I act exactly like a dog. He acts exactly like like a cow, like an ox. What's you know, what good thing is gonna come to us? Right? What wholesomeness have we been developing? What did the Supreme Buddha say? He didn't want to. He didn't even want to tell them. Right? It was so bad. He didn't even want to tell them. But they they begged and they begged. They said, "What's you know? What's going to happen to us? What's going to be the result of this observance?" And the Supreme Buddha said, "Well, if you've if you've perfected this observance, if you really have uh, acted like a dog." in every single way, acted like an ox in every single way. Then when you die and you're reborn, you're gonna be reborn as a dog, right? You're gonna be reborn as an ox. And if you don't perfect it, then you'll re be reborn in hell, in a very bad destination. So does this observance that they did, does it cultivate wholesome qualities, help them abandon unwholesome qualities? No, no, they've completely misunderstood the results of actions. One day, uh, Chunda, the smith, came to the, to the Supreme Buddha, and the Supreme Buddha asked him, whose teaching, whose observances do you respect? And he said, well, there's some Brahmins uh, in the Western countries, and they, they encourage us, uh, they say, that you can purify yourself. If when you wake up in the morning, you, you rub the earth, okay? That you can, you can cultivate wholesome qualities by, 
by rubbing the earth. And if you can't rub the earth, then you should stroke uh, wet cow dung. Right? Yeah, people believe these sorts of things. It's amazing. If you can't stroke wet cow dung, then, then bow down to the sun. Right? That you can purify yourself by these observances. What do you think? Does this sound like the Supreme Buddha's teaching? What happens if you stroke wet cow dung? Your hand gets dirty, right? Does your greed go away? Does your hatred go away? No. No, not at all. So what kind of observances did the Supreme Buddha encourage us to do? How about the Uposita observance? He said it's very good to come together with Kalyanamittas as often as you can, twice a month, four times a month, as often as you can, and observe the eight precepts. Imitate great arahants. Undertake the precept of, of abstaining from killing. Right? This is an observance. We observe the precepts. And when we observe this precept of not killing, wholesome qualities increase. When we, ob we observe the precept of, of not stealing, do wholesome qualities increase or decrease? Increase, yeah. We, we become not greedy for other people's things. When we abstain from, from sexual misconduct, do our wholesome qualities increase or decrease? They increase. Think about this. You know, all the unwholesome things that come when people commit sexual misconduct. On the, on the Oposita day, you observe uh, only eating in the morning time, only eating at one time of the day, right? And does this, does this increase your wholesome qualities? I know many of you have, have done this, this Oposita practice, right? Does it increase your wholesome qualities? Do you realize you can, you can live with a little bit less food, right? You come here to the Asapua and people give you whatever food it is that they want to offer, you just, you accept whatever it is that they give. Maybe you wanted one thing, but, but, uh, but you're happy with, with what it is that you get. And you realize, you know, by not being greedy, my mind is, is much more peaceful. So in the Oposita, you, you abstain from, from listening to music, from dancing, from wearing uh, makeup, garlands, right? All these things, the Supreme Buddha said, are wholesome, right? They're not extreme. They're just enough to help us overcome unwholesome qualities. Not using fancy beds, not using fancy seats, just making do with simple things. The Supreme Buddha said, when we do this, wholesome qualities increase. Unwholesome qualities decrease. We realize uh, the happiness that can come from a simple life. The Supreme Buddha said, if householder, when one strives in a particular way, unwholesome qualities increase and wholesome qualities decline, then I say one should not strive in such a way. But if when one strives in a particular way, unwholesome qualities decline and wholesome qualities increase, then I say one should strive in this way. So we can think about the, the strivings of the, the Nigantas, right? In the time of the Supreme Buddha, he went to them and asked, you know, why is it that you're, you're doing these, this striving that you do? Right? Because they endured many painful feelings. They, they did whatever they could to, to cause painful feelings in their body. They worked very hard at it. Right? It, wasn't, it wasn't some simple thing. They weren't lazy. Right? They had to work very hard to, uh, to torment their body, standing out in the sun, maybe standing on one leg for days and days at a time, maybe even... Uh, hitting themselves, hitting their bodies, lying down on, on thorns, right? Not on soft beds, but on, on beds of thorns. 
And they said, well, we're, we're purifying our, our past bad actions because it's through pain that, that one purifies. The Supreme Buddha said, no, that's not how we strive. That's not proper striving. He gave very excellent instructions for striving to his disciples. He said, you know, live in a kuti, live in a quiet place. During the day, stay awake. Look at your mind. Remove unwholesome qualities. Cultivate wholesome qualities. Eat simple food. Eat alms food. Eat just in the, in the morning time. These are things that you have to work very hard at. Right? It's not a lazy life that the Supreme Buddha taught. He taught, you, you have to work at this. You have to exert effort. If you, don't, if you don't exert effort, then you'll just keep the same unwholesome qualities that you had. You won't develop new, un, new wholesome qualities. We have to work very hard to learn this supreme dhamma, right? It's not, uh, it's not a very easy thing to understand. We have to, we have to apply our mind. We have to, to listen to the teachings again and again and think about them wisely. We have to reflect on them. How does this apply to my life? How can I put this into practice? We have to work very hard. We have to exert a lot of effort. So we think about the, the striving that the Arahants did to purify their minds, that the kind of striving that they did uh, is very wholesome striving. In the world, we can think that there's all sorts of striving that people do, but it doesn't necessarily lead to wholesome qualities, right? People can, can work very hard to become hunters, right? There's a whole industry around selling people things, right? All sorts of tools to help people hunt. They work very hard at it, right? They get together with other hunters. They talk about techniques. When they go out hunting, maybe they sit in they sit in a tree for hours and hours, just watching very carefully, right? They're working very hard, right? It's a striving that they're doing. But are they cultivating wholesome qualities as they look out into the forest trying to find something to kill? No, they're cultivating unwholesome qualities, cultivating thoughts of greed, thoughts of ill will. People can work very hard to, to steal things, it's not an easy job to steal things. Sometimes stealing is easy, but some people work very hard at it because they don't want to get caught. So they, they learn all sorts of techniques and they're very careful, right? They sneak around very carefully, they investigate, right? They do a sort of investigation of a house, right? Casing a house, right? They work very hard. They strive very hard. But is this the sort of striving that the Supreme Buddha encourages us to do? No. He says, this is unwholesome. This sort of striving, this sort of working leads to unwholesome qualities. The Supreme Buddha said, if householder, when one relinquishes something, unwholesome qualities increase and wholesome qualities decline, then I say, one should not make such a relinquishment. But if, when one relinquishes something, unwholesome qualities decline and wholesome qualities increase, then I say one should make such a relinquishment. So how about our noble friends? Should we relinquish our noble friends? Should we give up our, our good companions, friends who know the Dhamma? Is that something we should give up? No. What happens when we give up our, our Kalyanamittas? Right? Yeah. We lose this chance to learn the Dhamma. We lose this encouragement that we get, right? So we don't give everything up. Did the Supreme Buddha encourage us to, to take a vow of silence, that we should give up speaking completely? Did he encourage us to do that? No. In fact, the, the monks, his monks and nuns are not allowed to take a vow of silence. Once some monks during the, the Vasa, during the rainy season, they decided, we're going to, to live very purely. We're not going to talk at all. 
the whole three months, we won't say a word to each other. We'll just use, we'll just use hand signals right, to communicate. And so at the end of the, the vasa, they went and saw the Supreme Buddha, and he said, how are you doing? Did you live in harmony? And they said, yes, we lived in harmony. We didn't say a word to each other the whole time. And he did not praise this, this kind of relinquishing, this kind of giving up. He said, you foolish people, right? This is how animals get along together, right? By not talking to each other. This, this isn't the, way, the right way. He said, you have to be able to, to talk Dhamma to each other. This is how the, uh, his diligent disciples practiced, right? When it was time to, to talk about the Dhamma, they talked together. This was how they, they helped each other. So what are some of the things that, that the Supreme Buddha did teach us to relinquish, right? To relinquish our greed, right? When we practice dana, we're, we're giving things up, aren't we? When, we, when you come to the asapu and you give, give food to the sangha, that's food that you're not going to get to eat, right? You can't give it to your friends, right? You're giving it up uh, to the sangha. And by doing that, you're cultivating many wholesome qualities, many wholesome qualities. The Supreme Buddha praised celibacy, right? He said that, that this sexual activity, it's something that you can give up. Some people think it's not. Some people think that it's essential, right? That you need, you need food, you need shelter, you need clothing, and you need sex, right? Some people think that it's, it's essential, that it's something that you can't live without. But the Supreme Buddha knew that's not the case. In fact, when you, when you practice celibacy, it cultivates wholesome qualities that, that you give up this lust, this desire, this passion for sensual pleasures. The Supreme Buddha encouraged his, the, he laid down a precept for the, his monks and nuns to give up money, right? So monks and nuns, they don't use money. He said that this is a very wholesome thing. When, when a person doesn't use money, they're content with whatever it is that they get. They're not... Uh, not searching around for things. The Supreme Buddha said that, that for anyone who can use money, then any unwholesome sort of thing is available right at their fingertips. They can get, they can get into all sorts of trouble. Right? Don't people get into trouble with money? Yeah, in many ways. So that's, those are things that the Supreme Buddha encouraged us to relinquish. The Supreme Buddha said, if householder, when one attains a particular liberation, unwholesome qualities increase and wholesome qualities decline, then I say one should not attain such a liberation. But if, when one attains a particular liberation, unwholesome qualities decline and wholesome qualities increase, then I say one should attain such a liberation. So what is, what is the liberation that the Supreme Buddha encourages us to attain? Liberation from this round of samsara. Liberation from the taints. The taint of sensuality, the taint of becoming, the taint of ignorance, the taint of views. And how do we do this? By understanding the Four Noble Truths, realizing the Four Noble Truths. The Supreme Buddha said, this is the sort of liberation that I praise. This is the kind of liberation that I, that I encourage you. Because when, when someone's realized the Four Noble Truths, do they have wholesome qualities or unwholesome qualities? Many wholesome qualities. They, they start to get rid of all of their, their unwholesome qualities. So the Supreme Buddha said, this is, this is the kind of liberation that I praise. Then when the householder, Vajya Mahita, had been instructed, encouraged, inspired, and gladdened by the Blessed One with a Dhamma talk, he rose from his seat, paid homage to the Blessed One, circumambulated him, keeping him on the right side, keeping the right side towards him, 
and departed. So the Venerable Vajimahita got to hear this excellent, this excellent teaching, this excellent exposition. Then, not long after the householder Vajjyamahita had left, the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus. Bhikkhus, if any bhikkhu, even one who has long had little dust in his eyes regarding this Dhamma and discipline, would thoroughly refute with reasoned argument the wanderers of other sects, he would refute them in just such a way as the householder Vajjyamahita has done. So he says, even if, even if a very wise bhikkhu were to, to explain this Dhamma to these householders, this very wise bhikkhu would explain it in just the same way that the householder Vajjyamahita had done. So we think, we can, we can think about this and know that the Supreme Buddha praised his lay disciples. He encouraged them to learn the Dhamma very well. This Dhamma isn't something just for, for the monks and nuns to learn. This is something that, that even his lay disciples learned very well so they can explain to people uh, what is Dhamma, what isn't Dhamma. When someone says, is, is this what the Buddha says? Right? Is, this, is, this, is this what your teacher says? They know right away is, if this is something that the Supreme Buddha taught. So today we've had this, this excellent opportunity to hear the teaching of the Supreme Buddha, the teaching that's not one-sided, that the Supreme Buddha doesn't just make generalizations, and he doesn't avoid giving answers. He gives very clear answers. He encourages us to cultivate wholesome qualities and to do those things that cultivate wholesome qualities, that those things that don't help us cultivate wholesome qualities he says he doesn't praise those things, right? So, again and again, we've been reborn in this long round of samsara from not hearing this supreme dhamma, from not knowing about wholesome qualities, not knowing about unwholesome qualities, not knowing the right way to strive, not knowing the things to relinquish, not knowing the correct things to observe, not knowing the correct austere practices to do, not knowing proper liberation, the right liberation that leads to the destruction of all the taints. So may we keep these teachings in mind that lead to the destruction of the taints. May we practice them well. May we reflect on them. May we live in accordance with them. And through the power of this merit, may we one day realize the Four Noble Truths in this Gautama Buddha's dispensation. Sad, sad, sad. Namo Buddhaya.